Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the History Live series at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. This program honors the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and chronicles the events during the last five years of his life. Our History Alive presenter, John McCaskill, will tell the story of individuals that fought to end racial segregation and discrimination against African Americans in the United States. Dr. King's powerful message of equality and human potential will always be relevant and worthy of discussion. I would like to encourage you to consider Dr. King's legacy and the connections to your own lives outside of this program. Throughout today's program, there'll be moments of reflection while I will pose questions to viewers. If you're watching this with others, feel free to have a discussion amongst yourselves. And with that, I'll hand things over to John. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was probably one of the most recognized individuals of the civil rights movement. And yet if Doc was here today, he would be one of the first to say that there were hundreds of thousands of individuals who were part of the movement, names who we may never remember again. His memorial in Washington, D.C., well, should I say the theme of his memorial is Out of a Mountain of Despair, a Stone of Hope. August 28, 1963, while preaching his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Doc talked about Hugh, out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Now, in order for us to understand the significance of that particular march, we have to go back to 1963, but not August. April of 1963, Dr. King had taken his protests down to Birmingham. We're going to look at the last five years of Doc's life. Let's go back to Birmingham. Now, Dr. King takes his movement down to Birmingham, April of 1963, and he's going down there to address some of the civil rights challenges that were going on. Now, Doc is aware that one of the key elements to this movie, uh, to this movement, is the media. And so Doc's idea is this, nonviolent demonstration by the thousands, those individuals getting arrested, filling up the jails, calling media attention to Birmingham, and it would be a national, if not worldwide, call. But Birmingham was just a little ahead of where Doc was, and they realized, okay, this is going to probably be a strategy. So they started to call some of the surrounding jurisdictions. Listen, if we arrest 30 people, can you handle them? They call another one. If we arrest 25 people, can you handle them? And so they had a plan in place that if people were arrested, they would be taken to other jails, and that's what ended up happening. And the problem was people got arrested, and nothing happened. And so Doc is somewhat perplexed. He's trying to figure out what's his next move going to be. Those guys are meeting um, at, at the motel and they're trying to figure out, OK, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Doc, who did not have an answer at the time, said, I'm going to go to my room and I'm going to pray about it. Doc goes in when he comes back out. He comes back out in blue jeans and a blue denim shirt. He and Dr. Abernathy both have decided, you know what? We're not going to be uh, in church on this Sunday. We're going to probably be in jail. Now, let me just tell you, preachers can preach anywhere they want. They can go anywhere they want, except for one particular Sunday out of the year, and that is Easter Sunday. And it's Good Friday, and, dress, and Doc comes out dressed in a manner to say, I'm probably not going to be at Ebenezer this weekend. I'm going to be in jail. And so Doc goes and marches, and he and Dr. Abernathy both are arrested. Now, while he is in jail, he writes his iconic letter from a Birmingham jail, and he addresses a whole uh, lot of issues. As a matter of fact, there were some clergy like, look, you know what, Doc, you shouldn't even be down here. You don't live here. You know, you're just stirring up trouble. You know, our, our folk are happy the way things are. Uh, you need to leave things alone. And Doc addresses in, in some of what he talks about in his letter. He talks about the fact that there were 40 or so unsolved bombings of houses and churches. And, uh, and Doc says, but nobody has, has, has thought about doing anything about that. And he also talks about that, you know, if laws are just, you know, if laws are affecting uh, everyone, then maybe it's a just law. But if it only affects certain people, then it's not a just law. And he talks about in his letter why they were there marching in the first place. He told them, look, we were invited to come down here and that's why we are here. While they're trying to figure out what to do next, they think that maybe we ought to let the children march. 
Now, why would you let children march? Because they don't have jobs to lose. Unlike parents, if they march, get arrested, go to jail, they could lose their jobs and lose their livelihood. But that could not be the case with the kids. So they started marching the kids. And one of the churches where they met was the 16th Street Baptist Church. And those kids assembled and they marched. And just a few blocks later, they were met with police dogs and fire hoses. Now, this was not your garden variety uh, water hose. These were 200 pound per square inch fire hoses. And if you look at the footage, you'll see that individuals were being swept off their feet and they're putting these dogs and these dogs are, are, are tearing away the clothes of some of these kids. The media is out there and they see it and their photographs. And this is critical because this is during the Cold War and the United States was engaged in, in, in conflicts around the world for freedom and democracy. Well, people could look at that and say, okay, freedom and democracy, we understand, but how do you explain what you're doing to your own people? I've seen some of the newspapers I didn't understand the language, but the photos spoke a thousand words. And to see these images called attention to what was going on down in Birmingham. And then the White House starts to put pressure on Birmingham. They say, listen, I don't know what's going on down there, but you guys need to fix this stuff right now. And so Birmingham pledged to make some changes. And, uh, and that's what happened. But Doc understood that uh, those changes were not going to be enough, that there was still work ahead. As you could surmise from John's discussion, during the civil rights movement of 1945 to 1968, a lot of the leaders were young people. These activists fought to overcome social inequality and injustices in the United States. Today's youth have a lot in their mind as well. While some issues have always been there, there have been new obstacles beginning to surface in the eyes of the public. What are some examples of inequality affecting the lives of young people today? Dr. King wanted to keep up the initiative from their victories at Birmingham. And so Dr. King went to Washington, D.C. to talk to the president about a civil rights bill. Now, President John F. Kennedy understood, but he's like, Doc, I feel you, but I am dealing with the Southern Congress and they don't want to see stuff changing too fast. Dr. King was approached by A. Philip Randolph to march on Washington, D.C. Now, this is the same A. Philip Randolph who in 1941 was going to have a march on Washington for blacks having the opportunity to work in industry during World War II. And he approaches Doc about coming to Washington with a grand march that will once again bring the issues of the day before a national audience. 250,000 individuals participated in the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. 
Now that was no small undertaking to get those people into the city. They were considering sandwiches, water, how do you feed these people? At one point, some of the organizers were like, nobody's coming. It's not that they were not coming, there were backups on the interstate. Now there were many individuals who were scheduled to speak. Dr. King was supposed to speak earlier in the day. But one of the individuals had a pretty, and I would, I would probably say it's one of the second most popular speeches of the day, and that speech was made by the great John Lewis. Now he's a young 24, 25 year old at the time, and his speech was kind of radical. As a matter of fact, somewhere in his speech, he had something along the lines of, if they don't change, we will march through the South like Sherman marched through Georgia. I don't need to tell you that some of the older individuals like A. Philip Randolph was like, son, you cannot say that. Please, please, please change your speech. There was a concern that 250,000 folk would march on the White House or, or the Capitol or something, and they were concerned about that. And out of honor of those individuals, Mr. Lewis changed his speech. And so they decided to have Dr. King to go on last to be a unifying voice. It is August 28th, 1963. Imagine you are there. Normally in Washington, DC, the humidity is 100% in August, but not today. It was quite pleasant actually. And you're there, you've heard other speeches, you may have had your feet in the reflecting pool at some point, but now it is time to hear Dr. King. And you hear the words of A. Philip Randolph as he's introducing Doc, saying, the moral leader of our time, Dr. Martin Luther King, J.R. And they start to clap, there's, an, there's a, the, the ovation is deafening. And when Doc steps up, he starts his speech five score years ago. Why didn't he just simply say 100 years ago? Why didn't he just simply say in 1963? Because that five score language sounds very similar to four score years ago. They, he is standing in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial and he's referring to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. But he also references the Constitution. He references the Declaration of Independence. Why? Because he's tying his argument in with documents that Americans find as being critical documents in American history. He talks about uh, a promissory note and they were coming on that day to cash in a promissory note that was written in 1863. He says, but it has come back marked insufficient funds. But Doc goes on to say, I refuse to believe that the vaults of opportunity in this country are bankrupt. And he begins to, to make his speech, a speech that he did not necessarily think was one of his best speeches. But what I love about his speech at the end, when he goes into his, I have a dream theme, and when he first says it, go back and listen to it. He says, the first time he says, I still have a dream. I'm wondering why would he say still the first time around? I can hear him, I can understand him saying, I have a dream. And then going on later, I still have a dream. That word still bothered me. Why? It, it, it almost makes it sound as if he's had this dream before. This was not the first time he had that dream. Y.T. Walker, who was on Doc's staff, he said, uh, you know, we had heard that I have a dream ending, you know, 20 or 30 times. He said, Doc, you need to change it. About six weeks before, he was at Cobo Hall in, in, in Michigan, Detroit, and he had a very similar speech, but had the same I have a dream ending. And I know the night before he was at the Willard Hotel trying to work on the ending of his I Have a Dream speech. Why would you have to work on an ending that you had done 20, 30 times? Here's what I believe. Doc was going to have an entirely different ending. It, this probably wouldn't have been called the I Have a Dream speech. It would have been the, the marching in, in Washington speech or we're marching up to Zion or the big payback or something, but it would not have been I Have a Dream. And yet he ends in a manner where we know this as the I have a dream speech. 
He says, I have a dream that's deeply rooted in the American dream. Well, wait a minute, that's a good question. What was the American dream? I think Mr. Jefferson helped us with that when he said that the American dream was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oh my goodness. So Doc talks about this, I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream. And he talks about, I have a dream where my children will, will grow up and not be judged by the color of their skin, by the content of their character. He, he, he talks about this dream. And interestingly, you know, he was going to have a different ending. Mahalia Jackson, who was probably one of the most iconic gospel singers of her day, if not of all time, had sung for Doc on several occasions. And she's on the platform and there's footage and she's sitting up there and she's telling him, tell him about the dream, tell him about the dream. Doc was gonna probably go somewhere else, but he decided to go with the I have a dream ending. And you can tell because when you look at the footage, Doc ain't looking at his notes anymore. He starts looking up, he starts looking away. <laughs> Clarence Jones, who was Dr. King's attorney and speech writer, turned to somebody and said, they don't know it, but he about to take them to church. <laughs> Let me just tell you, this doc took us to church and he closed that thing out. And oh my goodness, at the end, he, he, he says, um, he, he says, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free, and turns around and walks off. And I tell you, the place erupted. It was absolutely incredible. Everyone had a good feeling after that march. Nobody rioted. I think people were excited about that too. And Dr. Abernathy even went on to say that there was a calm feeling after that march. And he felt as if changes were going to come. 18 days later, reality hit us in the face again. Sunday, September 15th, 1963, 16th Street Baptist Church, just before 11 o'clock service. If you recall, the 16th Street Baptist Church is one of the churches where the young people assembled back in April of 63. Sunday school was over and people were getting ready for 11 o'clock service. There were five young girls in the women's lounge getting ready for service. They were putting on their robes, they were putting on their sash. Then there was a phone call. It simply said something to the effect of five minutes. And two minutes later, 15 sticks of dynamite exploded adjacent to the 16th Street Baptist Church, right where that women's lounge was. Four little girls were killed in the explosion, but there was a fifth young girl in the bathroom, Sarah Collins Rudolph. She was a sister of Addie Mae Collins. This was an outright, we will kill you, we will kill your children, and we don't care. Bombing a church? People are trying to get closer to God. Dr. King felt like the weight of the world was on his shoulders. He did eulogies for three of the four girls. And there was some controversy in the first place over allowing children to march. Malcolm X even said, you don't send children to do a man's job. These children were killed. And then a few weeks later, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Reverend Dr. Walter Fontroy, who was on DC's, uh, Dr. King's DC staff, said we were sitting around and we all had a lump in our throat. He says, we realized if they could kill a president, we knew they could kill Dr. King. One of the first things that President Johnson did when he first started was declare his war on poverty. Now, this was supposed to be a way of getting people who were, I guess, considered lower class up to middle class, whatever that's supposed to mean, which would have been an increase in education, jobs, healthcare, all of that stuff. And so that's what his plan is. 
Freedom Summer begins in 1964, and it is a massive effort to get the people down in the South registered to vote, specifically places like Mississippi. Now, right after Reconstruction, 1877 or so, there is a lot of pushback. Well, there had already been pushback about allowing blacks the right to vote, but this is when a lot of that ends up uh, should I say not being enforced and people who may have been on the rolls as eligible voters 10 years later, those, those roles had decreased significantly, but there's always been pushback about allowing people to vote and who's eligible to vote. And so people went down, as you can see, they were talking, not going door to door, talking to residents, trying to get them to vote. And these were mainly, college students, kids from the North coming down to help to do that. And a lot of them understood the cost. And many of these young college students were signing their last will and testaments before they would go and embark on these cases. Three of these, the individuals who died were Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, three civil rights workers who were killed in Mississippi. They were arrested. Uh, and let out of jail probably around 2 a.m. and were never seen from again. They found their station wagon that had been burned out, and I think probably about six weeks after, uh, with because of an anonymous tip, uh, someone had told the FBI where those bodies were found, and that is a picture of them um, being uh, being discovered. And so we can see that people not only were willing to put their lives on the line for this, some of them put their lives on the line. And also in 1964, July 2nd, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. The march from Selma to Montgomery was also to bring national attention to the problem that was going on. Now, this march was led by John Lewis and Jose Williams. March 7, 1965, they are marching towards the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now, this was not an illegal march. Uh, they did not have the necessary credentials. And so they were met by state troopers. And the state troopers told them that they would not be allowed to continue the march. These state troopers were wearing uh, riot gear, billy clubs, and you could hear their boots along the sidewalk, along the asphalt as they were moving towards the marchers. Now, music did not have to start playing in a minor key for you to know that something was going on. They started pushing these demonstrators and there is iconic footage, as you can see, of what happened next. The movie Judgment of Nuremberg was being shown on the ABC movie and it was interrupted. People saw images of tear gas, horses, people being billy club, and many people thought it was going on somewhere else in the world, but it was going on in the United States of America. People were astonished. The media once again was there and they're seeing this playing on national television and people are wondering how can this go on? United States, which stands for freedom, democracy, and liberty. Yeah, we get that. But how do you explain what you're doing to your people? John Lewis was there and he was injured in that engagement. Now, Dr. King did not get sick often, but in 1965, he went into the hospital recovering from exhaustion. While he was there, he learned that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, winning this award, pretty much justified in the eyes of the world that what Dr. King was doing was right. One of the things that I wanted to point out here in this magnificent museum is this bucket. After the march from Selma to Montgomery, Dr. King soaked his feet in that bucket. The Work of Freedom Summer paid off. 1965, the Voters' Rights Bill was signed. And what this did was eliminate prerequisites to voting such as grandfather clauses, literacy tests, and poll taxes. August 11th, 1965, just over a month after the voters' rights bill was signed, 
uh, riots broke out in Watts. Now, Watts was not a southern city. Watts was a northern city. And Dr. King went out there to see if he could be of assistance. To his surprise, when he got there, a lot of those younger protesters were like, you know, Doc, you know, your nonviolent approach ain't working. It's not, it's not helping, and we don't really want you out here. And Doc was surprised that they did not want his assistance out there. But what he realized while out there was there were challenges going on in northern cities as well. And these challenges uh, blacks were having to deal with. And so he decided to, uh, to take the movement into the north. And in 1966, Doc went to Chicago. One of the things that he wanted to expose while he was there was the discrepancy or the racism in, in housing. And they did an experiment or an exercise, if you will, of two couples, a white couple, a black couple. They both had equal qualifications and they would send the black couple into a realtor's office and they would say, hey, we'd like to live in this area right now. Well, you can't live here, there's no vacancies here, but you can live here. Well, what about this, this area here? Oh, no, it's, it's, it's no vacancies. And they'd go through a lot of different places that were traditionally white neighborhoods and the realtors would say, well, we don't have any vacancies, but you can live here, 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 here. And then 30 minutes later, they'd send the white couple in and the white couple would ask for those places to be like, oh, yeah, sure, you can live anywhere you want. And what they discovered was that they were racially steering individuals into certain neighborhoods. And you know that by doing that, you could change the uh, property values of certain places. Uh, it's interesting because uh, in certain black neighborhoods, black families would have to pay a lot more for less and white families could rent in uh, neighborhoods and for a lower price and get more. And that was exposed. And Doc even tried, was living up there for a period of time. They brought this to the attention and Doc exposed it. And over time, uh, they tried to negotiate with the city of Chicago. But to be quite honest, this was a loss for Dr. King. They didn't really achieve much. One of the things that Dr. King talked about while being there was how hard it was to protest up in Chicago. I think at one point they tried to march through the town of Cicero. Listen, black folk uh, worked in Cicero, but black folk did not live in Cicero. And some of his most violent and scary protests took place in Chicago. Uh, there is footage of Doc got hit in the head with a brick while he was in Chicago. And, uh, and that was the type of thing that he went through. And it was, it was the North was, was just as difficult for Doc as the South was. By 1967, Dr. King realized that the war on poverty was not being won. And it was because of the war in Vietnam. April 4th, 1967, exactly one year to the day of Dr. King's assassination, he was up at Riverside Church in New York and he would and he publicly came out against the Vietnam War. Now, he had plenty of reasons as to why he opposed the war in Vietnam. He said that this war in Vietnam was actually a war on the war on poverty. He said that $53,000 was spent on each person killed in Vietnam, while only $53 was, was utilized for people who were poor. He talked about the fact that this war was being fought by poor young American men, many of the young men. I mean, there were certain zip codes that virtually sent all of their sons to war, while other zip codes did not send uh, many at all. Uh, and we know that certain people had deferments and were able to get out of, of, uh, of the draft. Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, came up with what he called the Project 100,000. It was supposed to be a way of getting individuals who were on the wrong side of the tracks or whatever, upward mobility. What it turned out to be for many young men was a one-way ticket to Vietnam. He also talked about the fact that this Vietnam War was a civil war and the people of Vietnam should be able to determine what direction that they're going to go in. And finally, this war in Vietnam uh, was taking money out of, uh, it was affecting the American 
economic system. And so those were just some of the reasons. Well, needless to say, at that point, uh, he had broken with the Johnson administration and President Johnson from then on referred to Dr. King as that Negro preacher and Negro was not the term he used. But I think that that was the point that marked the end of Dr. King. And so here's what Dr. King says. He says that we have the resources to eradicate poverty. The question is whether or not we have the will. August 1967, Doc preached his message, why Jesus called the man a fool. At some point, he refers back to the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955. And he said, you know, we were, we were, we were marching and folk found out we were serious. He says, and then the phone calls started. He says, I get 40 phone calls a day. And uh, one particular night he went home, he said his wife, uh, Miss Corey, was already asleep and he got a call. He said it was close to midnight. Strange things happen at midnight. He said there was an ugly voice on the other end. He says, Negro, and I am keeping this G rated. He says, Negro, if you don't cut this mess out, we're going to blow up your brains out and blow up your house. And Doc said that, you know, he, he thought that maybe if he had gone to the kitchen to get some coffee, it, it may have calmed his nerves. He didn't want to wake his wife. He said he looked over at his wife and saw her there. And he said he, he thought about her being taken away from him or him being taken away from her. He says, I thought about my darling daughter. He says, I've got four children now, but at that point it was just my daughter. And I thought about her darling smile and her being taken away from me. And so he said he went to the kitchen that night and he took his Bible and he said he prayed out loud, Lord, I, I'm tired, I'm weary, and I'm losing my courage. And the people can't see me this way because if they see me this way, they will lose their courage. Doc went on to say that that night he heard the voice of the Lord say to him, Martin Luther, Stand up for justice, stand up for righteousness, and lo, I will be with you always. And then Doc went on and he quoted the hymns. I've seen the lightning flashes. I've heard the thunders roll. I felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But then I heard the voice of Jesus who bid me to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. And then he went on into another hymn. Sometimes I feel discouraged and feel my works in vain. And and then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Oh, my goodness. February 1968, Doc is down at Marks, Mississippi, and they're going around seeing what's going on, particularly in the schools. And he comes to one school and he's talking to a teacher and he's asking, you know, so how's everything going? She says, well, it's rough. She says, we, uh, we don't have the materials. We don't have the books. We don't have the pencils, the, the pens, the paper. Uh, and we can't rely on uh, what the kids have been taught to be reinforced by their parents because many of them were illiterate as well, but, but they're working hard and, and they are hungry for education. And she says, oh, you know what? It's time for lunch. Don't go anywhere. This is only going to take a minute. So she goes to the back and she comes back out with a box of crackers and a bag of apples. And she takes the apple and she cuts it up into quarters and she gives each student a quarter of an apple and about four or five crackers and that's their lunch and for some of them that's all that they would have had to eat and dr abernathy is standing doc next to dr king and he sort of nudges him and he says do you see this and dr king with tears coming down his eyes just nods his head and dr abernathy said when they left that they were riding and Dr. King was quiet the entire time. And then finally he says, America has got to see what's going on in Marks, Mississippi. And so this is part of the genesis of the Poor People's March, which was scheduled for April of 1968. It was gonna be a whole lot more people in attendance uh, that were at the March on Washington in 63. And they were going to get everyone and Doc told everyone, I don't care if you got to walk, if you got a, you know, a mule train, whatever, that you need to come on up and we're going to help you when you come to Washington, D.C. 
As John stated, Martin Luther King Jr. initiated a mass movement to alleviate the poverty that ensnared 35 million Americans. The painted plywood mural that John was standing in front of is located in our Change in America 1968 and Beyond exhibit. It illustrates the interracial nature and diverse concerns of the demonstrators. Civil rights activists, cultural revolutionaries, hippies, gang members, and common poor folks lobbied for radical change to America's economic system. It was a multiracial coalition that demanded that poor people have access to employment, health care, and decent homes. Earlier, I asked you to think of examples of inequality affecting the lives of young people today. Empathy, or the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, is a key part of being responsible and a helpful community member. Dr. King was inspired to march after visiting a school in Marks, Mississippi, where children did not have access to an adequate school lunch. Calls for social justice often gain steam with collective empathy. What advice do you have for fostering a sense of collective responsibility and empathy? My friend, you know this soul was in a bad condition. Just the other day, I saw a group of little children trying to ride a school bus. By them being of a different nationality, they weren't allowed to ride the bus. And I imagine if you would ask them about this matter, they would have a word like this to say. Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference were planning to come up in April of 1968. While they were doing that, simultaneously, the sanitation workers down in Memphis were on strike. They were striking for better wages and shower facilities. I heard the testimony of one sanitation worker. He said the first couple of days he was going home on the bus, but because he was smelling like garbage, he was so uh, he was so embarrassed that he's, he walked home from that point on. And so Reverend Dr. James Lawson, who was a friend of Dr. King, uh, called uh, Dr. King to come down and speak. And so Dr. King went down and he spoke, uh, I believe it was March 18th, and it was supposed to be a speech and that was it. But Dr. King talked about marching. Well, Andrew Young was like, look, we had not, but we were in the middle of the poor people's campaign. We were not trying to, we didn't, we didn't know the lay of the land and they were not comfortable with marching, but they ended up going back to march on March 28th. That march was the first march led by Dr. King that turned violent. Now, there were a lot of reasons behind it. We don't have time to get into that. But Dr. King went back to his hotel. He actually went back to the uh, to the Holiday Inn. And the next day, newspaper articles came out. It's like, can he handle his people? How is he going to handle so many people in Washington, D.C.? He can't handle just a couple of thousand people down in Memphis. And, you know, why didn't he stay at the all black Lorraine Motel and all of that stuff? And so Doc was depressed from that. And he decided that uh, he had to go back to Memphis to prove that nonviolence would work. But before he went back, he was here in Washington, D.C., March 31st. This was his final Sunday morning sermon delivered at the National Cathedral, and he preached from the subject, remaining awake through a great revolution. Later that evening, President Johnson went on the air uh, to announce a ceasefire in Vietnam and that they were going to come to, to the table uh, to negotiate and end the Vietnam War. He also mentioned that he would not seek nor accept the nomination of his party for re-election as president of the United States. 
April 3rd, Doc arrived in Memphis. There was a storm warning going on and touch, tornadoes had touched down on the ground. Dr. King was not feeling well that night. He didn't think anybody was going to show up at the Mason Temple Church of God in Christ. So he asked Dr. Abernathy to go in his stead. Dr. Abernathy went and to his surprise, over 2000 people showed up. When he walked out onto the podium, the applause went crazy. Uh, but Dr. Abernathy realized they were not clapping for him. So he went back and called Dr. King on the phone and says, Doc, you need to get over here. You got 2,000 people out here and they want to hear you speak. And Doc's like, well, if you think I should come, I'll come. And so they sent for Doc. Doc came over. The plan was this. Doc was going to allow Dr. Abernathy to speak and Dr. King was going to get remarks or give remarks. Well, Dr. Abernathy spoke for about 30 minutes but he was introducing Doc the entire time. And so by the time he finished, the audience was ready for Dr. King. Dr. King left his seat, he walked to the podium, he, had, he was tired, he had a temperature, he was frustrated, and he had no notes in his hand. And he ended up preaching his final message, I've been to the mountaintop. And when he first starts talking, he talks about, you know, if the Almighty would allow me to stop uh, anywhere, in, in where, where would I stop? And he goes through these different places. At one point he says, and I could see um, at Mount Olympus, where I would see Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Euripides, assembled around the Parthenon, but I wouldn't stop there. And he keeps, he keeps coming down. At one point he says, I would stop at early in the, in the 19th century, when I would see a president grappling over whether or not to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, but I would not stop there. I would come down to early in the 20th century, when I would see a president who's telling us that we've got nothing to fear but fear itself. And then he goes on to say, but I would turn to the Almighty and say, if I could stop anywhere in the latter part of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now, you know, that black church experience, you know, folk was like, go ahead, Doc, go ahead, go ahead. And Doc starts to preach and he's talking about various things. And at one point he talks about when he was in New York signing his book. And he said, uh, there was a woman and asked, you know, are you Dr. King? He says, yes, I am. And he says he felt something beat in on his chest. Doc had been stabbed by a demented woman. They took Doc to the hospital. They performed emergency surgery. And they said that the blade was, the tip of the blade was so close to, to his aorta. If he had sneezed, he would have died. Well, he started to get a lot of letters. He says, I got a letter from the president, but I don't remember what he says. I got a letter from the government. I don't remember what he said. I got a letter from such and such. I don't remember what they said. He says, but I got a letter from a young girl in White Plains, New York and I never shall forget what she says. And he says, I need not mention the fact that she was a little white girl. And she just simply wrote, Dr. King, I heard about your situation and your suffering. And I heard that the tip of the blade was so close to your aorta that if you had died, if you had sneezed, you would have died. She says, I'm just writing to let you know, I'm so glad you didn't sneeze. And Doc took that sneeze theme and he starts, starts about, if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1960 when this happened. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1961 when uh, we went to, uh, when, the, when the Freedom Riders were riding. If I had sneezed, and he comes all the way and he talks about the present day, he says, if I had sneezed, I would not have been been here now for all of these sanitation workers who were protesting for what's right. And then Doc starts to end his message. He says, we've got some difficult days ahead. He says, um, you know, he talks about uh, flying in and they had to have the, the plane delayed because it was being searched to make sure that there was no bomb because we've got Dr. King on board. And he goes on and Doc ends that thing. He's like, you know, he says, like anybody, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm, I'm not concerned about that. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up and see, uh, go up to the mountaintop. And he says, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will make it to the promised land. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. 
Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. April 4th. Doc was feeling a whole lot better. His brother A.D. was in town, and both of them got to talk to uh, Mother King early that day, and she was happy about that. They spoke to her for about an hour. Now, Andy Young was away in, uh, at, at, at the court trying to get an illegal injunction thrown out, and he didn't call to tell them what was going on. And normally, if something like that would happen, it would be the sign of some, some bad news or so. But um, for lunch, Dr. Abernathy and Dr. King had catfish and salad. Now, they ordered two separate orders. But the waitress took it as a double, so the salads were separate, but the fish was on the same plate. And Dr. Abernathy was a little upset and wanted to tell her to go get it right. And Dr. King says, Ralph, don't worry about it. We can eat off the same plate. And that would be the last time that the two of them would eat together. Uh, as I said, Dr. Um, Dr. Abernathy and Dr. King were trying to hear word from Andrew Young. And when he finally showed up, you know, Dr. King is like, wait a minute, man, you know, you, you ain't calling me. What's up with that, man? How come you ain't let me know? I'm your leader. You need to tell me what's going on. And uh, Andrew Young is trying to explain what's going on. He couldn't get to a phone. Dr. King threw a pillow at him. Andy Young threw it back. And these grown men start pillow fighting right there in the room. And just as quickly as it started, it stopped. And Doc says, you know what? We need to get ready for dinner. And so Doc and Dr. Abernathy went upstairs to get ready, and they're getting themselves together. And Dr. Abernathy had made mention that, you know, they could uh, spend so much time in front of the mirror getting themselves together, which probably explains why those guys were always sharp every time you saw them. And Dr. Abernathy talked about some of the conversations that were going on outside. He says um, someone had made mention of, um, he said, uh, he said one of the conversations was something to the effect of, Jesse, you don't have a tie on. We're about to go to dinner. And Jesse Jackson says, Doc, the only thing you need for dinner is an appetite. Uh, there was another conversation that, um, Dr. Abernathy talked about, he says that uh, Andy Young had mentioned to Dr. King that he hadn't been feeling well. It's a little chilly out. You may want to take a coat. Doc says, yeah, you might be right. Uh, Billy Kyles was standing right next to Doc, and he said uh, he had just turned and was starting to walk away. Doc had said something to, I forget the person's name, but it was the musician who was supposed to play that night. He says, he says I want you to play uh, take my hand, precious Lord, play it real pretty. Dr. Abernathy said that he was, he, he was, he had error. I believe it was Aramis. He was rubbing his hands together and he said he was about to bring it up to his face when he heard, as he said, what sounded to be a car backfiring. He said, but there was something ominous about this sound. And he said he instinctively jumped like he normally would. And he looked out the door and he no longer saw Dr. King standing on the railing, but he saw his feet underneath the railing. Billy Kyle said that he turned, took a couple of steps, heard a bang and a uh, and he said he looked back and he saw that Doc had fallen. Uh, Doc was struck through the neck with a 30 yard six. That is a military grade rifle. The round entered his jaw and exited and re-entered in his neck. And Dr. Abernathy said that there was a, a hole big enough for him to put his fist through. Doc had been shot. Doc fell to the ground. Uh, Billy Kyle said he could see the color leaving Doc's face. And Dr. Abernathy was, he said he cradled Dr. King and he patted his cheek. He says, Martin, this is Ralph. Martin, this is Ralph. Everything is going to be all right. And a lot of stuff went on at that point. Uh, People didn't know how bad it was. They took him to the St. Joseph's Hospital, which was not that far. But for all practical purposes, uh, Doc had died. And yet somewhere I read, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it will bear fruit. It is because of the life and death and legacy of Dr. King that so many of us have benefited, not just African-Americans, but people altogether.
and we have accomplished quite a bit, but at the same time, there's still more to do. The work is still unfinished. I'm reminded of the words of James Weldon Johnson, lift every voice and sing till earth in heaven rings, rings with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of the faith the dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun let us march on till victory is won dr martin luther king jr was a pioneer and an advocate who inspired generations through his commitment to love and people his dream of empowerment and inclusion is a notion that we're still fighting for even today. I hope that you enjoy today's History Alive program. I also like to thank John for doing such a fantastic job. And I hope to see you at more of these presentations and programs. In closing, I would like to leave you with this final reflection. How will you continue Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s message of inclusion and equality in your own lives. Thank you.